of all, let me thank Howe Library for their collaboration on this Women's History Program. We had to move it, believe it or not, because of a snow day. No. We had to move it from March, and now we get one of the hottest days ever, right? <laughs> we didn't have to wear our boots today, so this is nice. We look forward to many programs with the How and other nonprofits in the Upper Valley. When I say other non nonprofits, I mean the Hanover Garden Club, the Hanover Conservancy. We like to have partnering with other groups. Um, tomorrow at 6.30 here at the How, um, we are also sponsoring Roads Taken and Not with Steve Taylor. So oh. Steve Taylor is going to be coming in and you can come back in person or you can go to the Zoom. And this will be about road construction in New Hampshire and how it impacted the development of New Hampshire and probably Vermont too. Um, on May 18th, we're going to have the, the history of agriculture as seen by looking at barns. And uh, the Han How Library is sponsoring that one. This summer, for those of you who are Hanover Historical Society members, there'll be a special tour of the Hood Museum and American Art. So get in touch with me if, if you want to join or if you want to know more about it. But we haven't announced it yet because it hasn't been formed up. Starting June 7th, Hanover Historical Society docents will be opening Webster Cottage. And I have Webster Cottage um, in this slide, so in case you forgot where it was. That'll be Wednesdays and Saturdays from 2.30 to 4.30. We encourage all of you who are tuning in on Zoom or here in the room to consider being a docent during this season. If you're interested, please contact me, biddingercynthia1 at gmail.com. I want to thank our Hanover Historical Society board for all their leadership. Raise your hand if you are a board member. <laughs> Go ahead. And I think some are on Zoom too. Thank you, Betsy. And also we have a docent here. Yeah, she is. So it's very nice to have docents and board members. At 7.30 tonight, we'll have Carolyn Cook zoom in from California and speak about Hannah Crosdale, the first tenured female Dartmouth professor. So hold on to your stories. Before she comes in, I'd like to suggest a few women who made history in Hanover. Some are on our website, which is HanoverHistory.org, those of you who don't know that. Many were written by Teresa Oden, a former board member, and I have a few suggestions. After I present these, go ahead and suggest your own women who made Hanover history. Remember what Laurel Thatcher Ulrich once said, well-behaved well -behaved women who seldom made history. I have a few who did behave, and I have some who really, I think we could say, had unusual lives, just like Hannah. We're going to be hearing about Hannah. First, Abenaki women. The area near the Connecticut River, which is where we are, was probably a location for the Abenaki who are known to have lived here. The women were very important for what they did. In the woodland period, 900 BC to 1600 AD, agriculture was practiced and women would grow squash, gourds, maize, beans. In addition, they would cultivate sunflowers and marsh elder. They would gather acorns, beech nuts, chestnuts, berries, and flowers. They were the ones to cut maple trees for the sweet sap, because we're talking about maple sugar season now. Basket making was primarily women's work, so women were the busy ones, while the men were primarily out hunting. We could have many sessions on the Abenaki, so that, that's something to think about. All right, next, Abigail Wheelock Ripley. Abigail would have been well acquainted with Native Americans. Her father educated two boys from the Delaware tribe beginning in 1754 when she was a little girl. 88 boys and girls of indigenous heritage were enrolled at a school in Connecticut during his time period. The Wheelock family moved to Hanover in 1770 when she was 19 years old. Two Indian students moved with them as well as several slaves. Her father owned 19 slaves over his lifetime and willed them to his son. Abigail is not mentioned as having slaves. And when I'm a docent at the cottage, I've often been asked by Dartmouth students, did slaves build the cottage? I really don't know. I have no idea. That's a, a further research question. Abigail's important because her house is the location of the Hanover Historical Society. Oh, next slide. There you go. It's one of the oldest 
uh, in town, built in 1780. The founder of Dartmouth College, Eliezer Wheelock, gave his daughter, Abigail, 15 acres when she married Sylvanus Ripley in 1774. She and her husband built the cottage. Her husband had graduated in the first class of, at Dartmouth. There were four people in the first class, by the way. <laughs> in 1771, he studied divinity, was a tutor at the college, a missionary, a trustee, and a professor. I think we can call her a professor's wife. When her father died in 1779, his will gave her 100 more acres, including the land down to the Connecticut River. Mm -hmm. She and her husband had six children and moved to the Choate House next door for a while. Most of you know where that is. That's right next door. She and her children returned to the cottage after Sylvanus died in a winter accident. Abigail eventually sold the house to her adult son and moved to Maine for the rest of her life. So I'm nominating her. I think we should put her little history on the website because mm -hmm. without her, we wouldn't have it. The right. house. Right. Okay. Next slide. Jane Wentworth. Hmm. Jane was a slave held in Hanover, New Hampshire. Now that's a really hard sentence for me to say. Sue Reed, one of our members, recently brought her to my attention and her gravestone is quite beautiful in the cemetery. In the records, Jane's family was in the possession of a Mrs. House here and then sold to a man in Salem, New Hampshire. She was freed there and married Charles Wentworth, a slave of Governor Wentworth. Hmm. They then moved to Hanover where she did the laundry and nursed ill Dartmouth students for over 40 years. Oh my God. Her son and grandson, next slide, volunteered, because you did have to volunteer, to fight in the Civil War as part of the 54th, the Black Regiment yeah. from Boston, now immortalized at St. Godin's. Right. She was a member of the Congregational Church here, and they erected the stone we just saw in her memory. So I think she should get on our website and maybe we can encourage even more study of uh, black history here. Um, Sue Reed mentioned that there's a black alumni group and they've been doing some history of Dartmouth. So maybe we can get something going, That's something to think about. All right, next slide. Laura Dewey Bridgman was born on a farm in rural Hanover in 1829. As a toddler, she was quick to learn and her parents thought she had unusual intelligence. But at the age of two and a half, she contracted scarlet fever and became deaf and blind. The family still encouraged her to help with the household and she learned to knit and sew. When she was seven years old, which is pretty young, Dr. Reuben Mussey at Dartmouth College thought Laura would benefit from the Perkins Institution for the Blind in Watertown, Massachusetts. There she learned to read and write and communicate, 50 years before the more famous Helen Keller. So she is one of our very interesting people. Wow. There was a fictional book written about her a few years ago. So she is definitely someone um, I would nominate uh, to be fairly well known in Hanover Sister, and she is on our website. All right, next slide. Kate Sanborn. Kate is also on our website. She was born in 1839 in Hanover. Her father. Edwin David Sanborn was a professor of classics at Dartmouth College. Her mother, Mary Webster, was a relative of Daniel Webster. Sanborn did not attend school, which is so interesting, but was educated at home. In memoirs and anecdotes, she wrote of an intellectually rich childhood in which she was introduced to politicians, academics, and writers who visited her father. So it sounds like Dartmouth and Hanover were quite an active place for her. After starting a day school for faculty children, Kate Sanborn continued her teaching career at Mary Institute in St. Louis, Missouri, when her father moved there to be president of Washington University. And later she went to Packer Institute in Brooklyn. She was also a newspaper magazine correspondent who reviewed books for Scribner's Magazine. In 1880, she was invited to teach English literature at Smith College. She was a popular lecturer, so she was quite beyond what you would expect of women at this time period. She was known for presenting literary topics in a humorous, entertaining manner. She traveled extensively. This is a single woman traveling extensively all over the country. In 1885, she wrote The Wit of Women. So she was quite interested in women and how they uh, lived. She thought um, women's humor was shaped by social attitudes. She also edited several collections of verse and published a Sunshine Calendar series. 
with famous Americans in it. She designed and wrote a series of study guides to literature. In 1888, Sanborn bought a dilapidated farm in Metcalf, which is now Holliston, Mass., and moved to Breezy Meadows, the setting of several light depictions of farm life. And she lived there too until her death in, seven, in 1917. So she was, her brother wrote about her. That's how I learned about her, really. I learned about her from the Smith archives and from her brother's um, loving book about her. So she's, she's someone definitely, I did encourage a Dartmouth student to write about her. Oh, yeah. So maybe we'll get more on her. Yes, welcome. I'm right in. Uh, next slide. Alice Van Leer Carrick Skinner. All right, we do have quite a bit on her on our website because one of our dear friends wrote a, an essay about her. So we have quite a lot of information on her. She was born in 1875 in Nashville, Tennessee, but moved with her family to Somerville, Massachusetts for her father's work. In her 20s, she met Prescott Ward Skinner in Boston. He completed his master's degree, taught at Harvard, and then went to Dartmouth to teach Romance languages. Do we still use that term, Romance languages? Mm -hmm. I guess so. <laughs> he married Alice in 1901, and they were to live in what we now call Webster Cottage. The next to nothing house is Webster Cottage, in case you didn't figure that out. She was a collector of antiques and published books about her adventures in antique collecting. She was the last resident of, of the co co cottage. She was just a fascinating person. She had parties all the time. Mm -hmm. She um, often would host visitors, bring visitors, and she was like a docent at Webster Cottage. She was oh. always having people come in. Hmm. Um, so she really was the last person to live there as a as a you know regular resident. But she also really elevated the cottage to something else. I think. And by collecting all these antiques and being knowledgeable about antiques, um, she also put the little cottage on the map of it. So that's why I, I don't can't find a photo of her. Maybe we can at some point. All right, the last one that I really wanted to focus on is Peg Hunter. Now, if you go to our website, you can see Roy Manuel's discussion of the hunters and their work in this town of Hanover and Norwich with the modern homes. You can hear a lot more about Peg and, and, and Ted. Peg was born in Baltimore, but grew up in New Jersey. She went to Wheaton College in Massachusetts, Smith College, and then was one of the first female students at the Harvard School of Design in 1942. There she met Ted Hunter. He had grown up in Hanover and brought his bride here for their architectural career which they had here from 40, 1945 to 1966. Sorry. They built homes here for professors and won a number of national design competitions. With more women working, Peg designed homes with open floor plans that combine cooking and childcare. So next slide, you'll see one of the homes. Oh. And there are many homes on Rip Road and up um, <coughs> Hamlock. A hemlock and up further on the hills. And then the next slide shows one of her open kitchens. Because she really did think, she was extremely liberated for her time period. She really thought that women should be able to, you know, do their kitchen work and watch their kids and sort of do everything, right? <laughs> um, while here, and I thought this was cute, I found out she was ch chairperson of the dance committee here in town <laughs> from 64 to to 66, and then she represented New Hampshire at the International Conference for Women Engineers and Scientists in 1964. She was definitely a pioneering modernist. She was very well known. I think she also taught at Dartmouth, probably under her husband's name, but I think she was an early teacher at Dartmouth as well, as a, as a female, an early teacher. So she, I feel she needs more, she could take some more study and more analysis. Um, and there are uh, several websites devoted to the Hunter's mid-century modern uh, buildings. So you can find that. There's a mid-century modern tour over in Norwich that you can sign up for this summer and see a lot of the Norwich ones. We had a Hanover one. It's a big production. If you want us to do it again, you have to let me know because the people who own these homes have to put their dogs in the kennel. They have to 
pay to have it all cleaned up, and it's a, it's a lot of pressure on them to perform mm -hmm. and have us look at their homes. But they did do it for us a few years ago, and it was just wonderful mm -hmm. to, yeah. to see yeah. the mid-century modern mm -hmm. homes here mm -hmm. in Hanover. It's so we do have them. them here. The tour in Norwich is pretty much out on the street, so maybe we could have one like that. You didn't go in Norwich. I think they only have you go in one. Uh, you basically look at them from afar type of thing. Um, now, do you have candidates for women in Hanover? Our next slide is, I mentioned, um, we have Jean Lynn oh, Hennessy yes. and Grace Hope Hill. Yep. They're mm -hmm. both on our website. They're, they're talks uh, that, that we've recorded. But maybe you, this group, might have a few ideas. Or we can talk about Hannah Crossdale if you'd like. Francis McCann Murray. Okay. Go ahead, tell us. I don't know very much about her, except I think she was maybe one of the first female professors here. And maybe in the medical <clears throat> school, she married Eldon Murray, and that's where the Murray part of her name, and he used to be part of Dartmouth Savings Bank, um, I think. And she had a very difficult time finding housing and, and just all the general nonsense about a woman can't do this, that, and the other thing. But... Definitely, she's one that I would like to know more about, but I just remember hearing about her, maybe through the Women's Network of the Upper Valley. Really? Okay. Um, yeah. Let me know, or if any of you want to work on any of this, yeah. it would be fun, you know? I, yes, <laughs> Mayor Mary. Lilla McLean Bradley. Oh, yeah. Oh, Lilla. Oh, well, yes. Actually, a lot of us knew Lilla. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Lilla McLean Bradley told me that she never worked for any politician that ever won. <laughs> Do you remember that? That was a direct quote from Lilla. Because she worked so hard for Democrats, and, and they never won. Yeah. She would just work and work and work, but they never seemed to make it. Yeah. Um, one of her favorites was Arnie Arneson. Oh, yeah. Me you remember too. Her? And Arnie Arneson said running in the political scene was like um, walking around in sewage. <laughs> That's what she said, and she said you had to go to your house to take a shower every night after being out with political watch. <laughs> oh, I love yeah, it. Yeah, that was Arnie Arneson. So yes, Lilla McLean Bradley. Okay, that's a good one. Anyone? Any? Any others? I just had a not yeah. one to nominate, Sandy. but a comment on Kate Sanborn. I never had known yeah. there's a Kate Sanborn room in the White Church, and I just had never known where it yeah. how it originated. Well, so, she, she's ve yeah. very interesting yeah. because she obviously didn't let her um, sex limit her at all. She went, and also pretty self-taught. I just mm. told you she didn't really mm. go to a school. Yeah. She's pretty self-taught, mm. and then had the nerve to write all these books mm. and travel mm. and speak, um, and then obviously paid as a teacher quite a bit. Um, so she she was extremely brave um, mm. person. Okay, any others? All right, now we have time for Hannah Crossdale stories. How many of you knew of Hannah? All right, several hands. Does anyone want to share anything you knew about her? Well, I'll start. I okay. remember her. I have this vivid memory of her fighting a fire on North Main Street. It would have been 1950, give or take a couple of years. And I was with a friend, a girlfriend. She, her father was headmaster of Clark School. If anybody remembers, yes, that. That Clark School uh, is in the history of Hanover too. There and was a so Clark School, but it then that, merged yeah. with um, the Cardigan Mountain. Yeah, Cardigan Mountain, and left. Yeah, yes. and her family went to Maine. Um, but I have a vivid memory of Hannah Crosdale. It must have impressed me because she was a woman fighting the fire. And uh, I think it was on North, my, was that the one at the corner of North Main and Chilt Road? What? The, the house? fire. The fire. fire. That's my impression. I that it went to Chilt Road, right across from Clark School. And there was a big fire at the corner oh. of Chilt Road in North Main, where the Chilt House now is. In a house? 
It was a big house. I don't remember. It was a big house because I remember it being a little house. Oh, she, but she I mentioned that it was a big house. Yeah. She mentioned it was a Webster cottage, but it wasn't. No. Betsy, you're hoping it wasn't Webster cottage was right near there. I know. It was. Yeah. So I would have said it would have been in the early 50s, 1950s. It would have been very, yeah, right around 1950 because mm -hmm. I, I read, I think that she stopped being a firefighter in 53. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would have been around 10, so I would have been out uh, on my own with a friend. But as I say, uh, that friend was uh, connected. With her, so you uh, mainly remember her as a firefighter. firefighter. Pardon? You yeah. mainly remember her as a firefighter. And did Does she any, wear the equipment, the proper equipment? I remember her truck and her. <laughs> <laughs> and that impressed you because yeah. that was out that of the ordinary. It really impressed me, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's great. Okay, other memories of Hannah? Yeah, my, Sandy. My cousin who's on Zoom will have more, but I, the, my cousin, uh, Hannah lived next to uh, my cousin on McKenna Road in Norwich for years. And I, I remember as a kid seeing her and one time in her full fire. I don't know why, but she must, you didn't change back then, maybe even as a female in the firehouse, she wore it back home, but I remember her yeah. big boots, but. Susie, maybe you have something else to share if she's if she's uh, on. Is, is Susie on? Yeah, but she's yeah. up there. She's talking. Actually. She's I'm talking, muted. but she's muted. She's muted. Susie, you're That's muted. Mute. Oh, there she is. No, let me unmute. There. Okay. Hi. Not sure oh. you can see me on Zoom. <laughs> we can see you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, what, what? I know. <laughs> Hi, everyone. What an amazing thing to have experienced, to have Hannah grow <laughs> up at, right next to me on McKenna Road, Norwich, <laughs> Vermont, right there on McKenna. And little, you know, did I know at that time just <laughs> how amazing this woman <laughs> is or was. It, it never occurred to me that it took 30 years to get tenure. It never occurred to me that anything that she was doing was unusual. I was small. I was just a kid. And we used to go to her house. And we all, Hannah always met us at the front door with some kind of treat. And eventually i remember as a child that hannah brought me into her living room and i looked at her living room and i as a small child thought i had never seen anything like this before <laughs> if you talk about botany she had Oh, I don't know, uh, at least 100, at least 100 pictures, possibly that she had drawn, drawn, excuse me, herself of plants. And she would take me from one plant to another, to another, to another, and then to another, 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 another. And I'm just a child and I don't realize <laughs> as I do now what I was looking at. Huh. Oh, she was something. And then we'd see her walking up and down McKenna Road, just walking up and down McKenna Road. And sometimes she would walk up and down McKenna Road in her fire. <laughs> Stuff. Yeah. But she was in no hurry. <laughs> <laughs> No, she was in no hurry at all. And we, you know, we'd look out and say, Yup, there's Hannah trying to, be, trying to be a fireman. And I want you to know that at some point, I think I may have grown up and gone out of McKenna Road, but her house burned down. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And it was a two-story kind of, you know, nothing to talk about house. <laughs> and, and it burned to the ground. And she and her mother rebuilt it to one story. And 
that is about all I remember about Hannah, except let me tell you how lucky, <laughs> how lucky was I, you know, absolutely nothing as a child as to what I was looking at. Yeah. Because if it took her 30 years to get tenure, which is, you know, all part of this whole experience that we're talking about. Susie, Susie, where are you? I'm in Portland, Maine now. In Portland, Maine. Okay, thank you for Portland, Maine, tuning in. 